Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Wednesday morning, December 6th, 2023. Hope everybody's doing all right today. Doing a viewer requested study today. I was sent a question, or given a question the other day. Who are the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6? So that's what we're going to talk about. We've got folks joining on. Of course, we're cross-posted onto the nearchurches.com Facebook page. And once our live stream is over, this content will be uploaded to the YouTube channel. And on all those what, uh, all those locations, all those pages, you can make comments, ask questions, and I will acknowledge them when I see them. There's Gail, there's Anna, good to see you guys. Like I said, as always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask them, and I will acknowledge them when I see them. I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 6, as you can see on the screen in front of you, and of course, if you're listening to the Podbean channel or the Google Podcast, whatever, if you're just listening and not watching, you can't see this, but on my screen, I'm in Genesis chapter 6. So we have this phrase a couple of times in Genesis 6. I'll start here with verse 2. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. You get down to verse 4. And it says, There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, that they bore children to them. They were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So this phrase particularly in Genesis chapter 6. Now, here's the thing. We read about sons of God in other places in the Old Testament, and we read about them several times in the New Testament. So, it is with this particular passage, Genesis 6, that the there are questions about it. And, of course, one of the beliefs is that these sons of God, and some of you may be familiar with this, these sons of God that... That refers to that phrase refers to fallen angels who came down and took on bodily form, and that's why there became or why there came to be giants on the earth because you have angel fallen angels what breeding I guess that's the best way to put it uh, reproducing let's use that word reproducing with humans and the result of that process led to giants so that's one theory. Uh, there's another theory that says basically the sons of God that that refers to, and again, particularly here in Genesis chapter 6, that that refers to like nobles, kings, uh, people, people of prominence in the world at that time. And then a third theory is that this is a phrase that refers to those who were following God, those who are faithful to God. So we're going to look at the passages that use this phrase and see if we can come up with a coherent and scriptural answer, a Bible answer. That's what we want. So, like I said, if you have any questions or comments while we're going through this, feel free to ask them, and I will address them when I see them. All right, so right here in Genesis chapter 6, I've got some notes written down here that I, wanna, that I want us to pay attention to. I think they are, well, they're not insignificant. If you've watched me any length of time, you know, one of the things that I talk about is the importance of context. Okay, what's going on in the verses around Genesis 6-2, where we read about the sons of God, and what's going, around in Gen what's going on around Genesis 6-4 when we read about the sons of God. And again, both of those passages you notice talk about them, the sons of God, in contrast to the daughters of men. All right? And a marriage, or marriage is being made between the two. So what is going on in the context? Here's what I want to do to help us kind of get that in our mind, particularly right here in Genesis chapter 6, and then we'll, we'll kind of branch out and look at some other passages in your Old Testament and your New Testament that I think will give us some good insight. Hey, Rhonda, good to see you. Hope you're doing well. All right, Genesis 6. And I'll just highlight as I read here. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. Okay, so right there, obviously, we're talking about humans. Men began to multiply, and they had daughters. Then we have this phrase, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, or saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. 
And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were mighty men, the mighty men, who were of old, men of renown. All right, so there's your, I guess you might say, there, by way of introduction to the sons of God and the daughters of men, there you go. But here's the question. What's going on in Genesis 5? What's going on in Genesis 6? Well, we know what's going on in Genesis chapter 6. Of course, you start reading in verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart, notice, of his heart, whose heart? The thoughts of his heart is, well, man was only evil continually, and the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth. So while we have this contrast of these sons of God and these daughters of men intermarrying, and from those intermarriages, you have uh, children being born to them. These were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. We have in the context the giants who lived on the earth in those days. Now, there are other passages that we will look at that talk about who the giants are. There are three Hebrew terms that are translated. Of course, I'm looking at a New King James Version. In the New King James Version, there are three Hebrew words that are translated as giants. And I think that will help us answer our question, too, about who these sons of God were. Here's what I want to do. I want to go, jump back to Genesis chapter 4, because again, if you're going to understand a singular verse or two verses, like Genesis 6-2 and Genesis 6-4, then you have, to, you have to look at everything going on around it. Of course, in Genesis 4, what is it, the first 15 verses, you have the record of Cain killing Abel, and then what transpired or what was the result of that sinful behavior. And then you have the family of Cain beginning in verse 16. Cain and his wife begin having children. They build a city. Uh, they call the name of the city after his son, Enoch. So it just tells us that. And in fact, here, I want to stop and read this here. Genesis, this is Genesis 4.18. To Enoch was born Irid, and Irid beget Mehujel, and Mehujel beget Methushael, and Methushael begot Lamech. It's always fun reading these names in the Old Testament. But notice what happens here in Genesis 4.19. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. All right, so in the larger biblical context, you go back to Genesis chapter 2, and you have the marriage institution, the first divine institution on earth. What is it? Well, it's, it's a man and a woman. You know, of course, we think of Matthew 19, we think of Mark chapter 10, uh, what, what is it in Luke? Luke? Luke chapter 16? Anyway, you have these passages that reference the creation account, the creation of marriage account, particularly Matthew 19 and Mark chapter 10, and marriage is one man and one woman, and whatever God has joined together, let not man put asunder. We think of the phrase... Uh, from the beginning, it was not so. You know, Moses permitted this because of the hardness of your heart's divorce. But from the beginning, it was not so. We know, oh, a couple more here. Hey, Brian. Good morning, Cherie. Good to see you guys. So we know from the beginning that God's marriage plan is one man and one woman and for life. Lamech took for himself, took for himself two wives. Well, Lamech is a descendant of Cain, who is the murderer of Abel. That is not insignificant in the context of the sons of God came into unto the daughters of men and married them. What you have here at the end of Genesis 6, I'm sorry, Genesis 4, beginning in verse 16 down through verse, essentially verse 24, is you have the first polygamist recorded in the biblical record. Lamech took two wives for himself Tells a little bit about that. Lamech said to his two wives, this is jumping down to Genesis 4 and verse 23, Lamech said to his two wives, now we know their names, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, I have killed a man for wounding me. So he's a polygamist, and he's a murderer. And 
you know, what, what was involved in the killing? Was it self-defense? Was it retaliatory? We don't know, but here's what we know. He killed somebody. He took someone's life, and he tells his two wives about it. Genesis 4, 16 to 24, talks to us about the daughters of men, descendants of Cain, who obviously followed in the footsteps of Cain in terms of sin. Well, then you turn to Genesis chapter 5, and as you see here at the top of the screen, my little app says, the family of Adam. All right, so who is the family of Adam? This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. Adam is the son of God. Now, I'm not using that term in the sense of um, divinity, like Jesus is the Son of God, but God created Adam, and in that sense, we can say literally that Adam was the Son of God. Adam lived 130 years, begot a son in his own likeness after his image, and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Adam were 930 years, and he died. Then we read a little bit, beginning in verse 6, about Seth. Enosh, we read about this descendancy that was initiated by the creative, the miraculous creative act of God that led to, ultimately, of course, Seth. Now, I'm pulling out my, let me get my own Bible out here. As you guys know, I make a lot of notes in my Bible. Descendants of Cain, we see the way that they go. The descendants of Seth. Now, I told you back there in Genesis chapter 4, from verses 16 to 24, we have the family of Cain that ultimately led to Lamech. But I want to show you this too. This is Genesis 4, beginning in verse 25. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. And this is, what, this is why. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also was born a son, and he named him Enosh. Then look at this phrase here. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Now that is a stark contrast with what you see with Cain and Lamech. Okay, both of those men, of course, Cain, again, murdered Abel. We know that. Lamech killed somebody for wounding him, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 23. That's the legacy. I think that's a good word. That is the legacy of the descendants of Cain. Well, Adam, being the created son of God, and I, if I'm not mistaken, let me look at this real quick. I believe Luke chapter 3, this was kind of rattling around in my head as I was thinking about this. I believe Luke chapter 3, yeah, here it is, Luke 3 and verse 38, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So Luke 3, 38, in fact, does call, refer to Adam as the son of God. But anyway, Cain, Lamech, both murderers, one of them a polygamist, Adam, the son of God, Luke 3, 38, obviously has Cain and Abel, but then he has Seth, and it's in this lineage that men, become, be, that men begin to call on the name of the Lord. In all of that, in all of that context, you know, Genesis is the foundation of Scripture. We're going to start studying the book of Genesis here tonight at, at Mammoth, and I'm, looking, I'm really looking forward to, to teaching this. I've not taught through Genesis in some time, but it's the foundation of the rest of Scripture. It's the beginnings of, of humanity, the human race, uh, government, marriage, you name it. It's the book of origins. In the recording of all of these events, Cain murdering his brother, Lamech, Cain's descendant, becoming a polygamist and taking someone's life, you also read about Adam, the son of God, having a son by the name of... Well, think about Abel. Abel was a righteous man, okay? Hebrews 11, what is it? Is it verse 4? Hebrews 11, 4? That tells us that Abel, by faith offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, and he obtained witness that he was righteous. So you have Abel and Seth, who were sons of Adam, who was the son of God. And it's during the days of Seth that men begin to call on the name of the Lord. That's the contrast that's being drawn here 
in Genesis 4 and 5 that leads us to where I am on the screen here. Genesis chapter 6. The account of the flood. I think that makes pretty clear who the sons of God are. It's not angels. You say, well, how can you say that definitively? I want to show you a couple of things. Genesis 6, the sons of God, is not a reference to angels. Where do I want to go first? I've got a few verses here. I'm going to go to, I'll tell you what, let me do this. I'll go to Job chapter 38 first. Job has been pleading his case. He wants to talk to God. Well, here's his chance. And it's interesting how God starts this. You know, how, why am I suffering so much? I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. I've got these three friends who are hounding me, essentially. I just want to stand before God. And I want to plead my own, I want to serve as my own lawyer in God's court. All right, so here's your shot. And here's where God starts with him. Since you want to take that upon yourself and stand in the presence of God and question him about why you're suffering the way you're suffering, you need to answer some questions first. So interesting here. Job 38, 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Yeah, Job, if you want to stand before me and question what's going on, then you know these answers. Well, we know that Job doesn't know these answers, and that's the point. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So you think about the creation account. In the beginning, and this is a vague, general statement of God's miraculous creative process. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1.1. Beginning in verse 3, you have the six-day process of God creating. Genesis 1 is a chronological account. This, this is what God did on day 1. This is what God did on day two, etc., all the way through day seven when God ceased his work. Whatever this means, Job 38, 6, to what were its foundations fastened, talking about the earth, or who laid its cornerstone? Job can't answer that. But here's one thing that God informs him of. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, when were angels created? I don't know. But they were there when God began his cre miraculous creative process as recorded in Genesis chapter 1. They witnessed what God was doing when he was laying the foundations of the earth, when he determined its measurements. The sons of God, that can't be a reference to man. Those are angels. All right, in that context, those are angels. And that's, that's kind of the point of what I'm talking about and why I brought this passage in. And I'll be turning over to another passage. I'm going to run over to Luke, um, Luke real quick. And chapter 20. The, the point is this. This phrase, sons of God, is contextual. In other what that means is, the context will tell you what that phrase means. Genesis 4 and 5 traces these lineages of humans whom God had created, beginning with Adam, obviously, miraculously. Some followed God and some didn't. So then you turn the page to Genesis 6 and God looks at what he's created and he has regret because man became so sinful. Now we'll go back to that passage, but let me turn you over here to Luke chapter 20. This is the discussion between Jesus and the Sadducees about the resurrection. Of course, the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection, so they're trying to trap Jesus in his words, but in fact, he catches them. So here's his answer to their question. Luke 20, verse 34, beginning. Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. Okay, so their question was, this woman has a husband, he dies, she remarries, he dies, and this happens seven times. To whom will she be married in the resurrection? So he's agreeing with them. The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. All right? But those who are counted worthy to attain that age Okay, another period of time. And the resurrection from the dead. Neither marry 
nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore. Okay, so that teaches me, Luke 20, verse 36, when it comes to the resurrection, when Christ returns, the trumpet sounds, all of that stuff, you know, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, death ceases to be at that point in time. You enter into eternity, heaven or hell. Nobody's going to die anymore. Neither can they die anymore. Notice this, for they, for they, well, who is the they that he's talking about? The sons of this age who marry and are given in marriage and who live in such a way as they attain the resurrection, resurrection from the dead. Notice this, though, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God. They're equal to the angels and are sons of God. Now, obviously, to live with God in eternity, you have to be a child of God. You have to be a faithful servant of His. But when that happens, you're not going to marry anymore. You're not going to die anymore. And you're going to be equal to the angels. And you are going to be sons of God. So that tells me again that there is a clear distinction between angelic beings and human beings. When humans die... You don't become an angel. Notice that. It doesn't say, neither can they die anymore, for they become angels. No. They are equal to the angels and are sons of God because they are sons of the resurrection. All right? So, different classes of being. I think that's a good way to phrase it. Okay, so for instance, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels when he took on flesh. Uh, Psalm chapter 8, verses, I think it's verses 4 and 5. Uh, who is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that you should visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. Humans are not angels. Angels are not humans. Angels don't become humans, and humans don't become angels. Angels were created at a different period of time. They were present when the foundations of the earth were laid in God's miraculous creative process. And then humans came onto the scene later. Kind of wrapping all that up, I think, I think that makes sense. Now, let me run back here to Genesis chapter 6. We've already looked at Genesis chapter 4 and 5, and I think that's significant because Genesis 4 and 5 are a prelude. They're like an introduction to what's going to happen here with Noah and his family. Cain and Lamech, polygamy, murder, Seth, Abel, men who, so far as the scriptural record indicates, were righteous. It was during those days that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. But again, notice this here in Genesis chapter 6. All right, men began to multiply on the face of the earth. Daughters were born to them, the men. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves. Again, verse, look at verse 3. I think this is a key here. My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. His time is going to be limited. Okay, remember Luke chapter 20. Angels don't die. Man's limited. Man will die. There is no possible way that Genesis 6, 2, and 4, and these sons of God can refer to angelic beings because they don't marry and they don't die. And again, humans aren't angels, angels aren't humans, and neither one can become the other. They are their own created class of being. I don't know if class is the right word, but I think you understand what I, what I mean by that. But anyway, you keep reading this text here. Hey, good morning, Connie. In Genesis chapter 6. All right, so... It's in the context of the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. Well, what is God's response to that? The Lord saw the wickedness of man. It was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his, man's, heart was only evil continually. I am sorry that I have made man on the earth. And he was grieved at his heart. So what are we going to do about that? Well, I'm going to destroy man, whom I have created from off the face of the earth, both man and beast. I mean, how many times do we have to read that to, to pick up what's being said? The sons of God were men, and that's precisely what they were. So are there other passages in the Bible that would help me understand this? Yeah, even in the Old Testament. Let me turn over here to 
1 Chronicles chapter 28. This is the context of Solomon building the temple. Let me see, where do I want to start here? I think I'll start in verse 4. 1 Chronicles 28, 4. However, the Lord God of Israel, this is Solomon speaking, chose me above all the house of my father to be a king over Israel forever, for he has chosen Judah to be the ruler, and of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he was pleased with me to make me king over all Israel. Now look at this. This is 1 Chronicles 28, 5. And all of my sons, for the Lord has given me many, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. Now he said to me, It is your son Solomon who shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son. God says of Solomon to David, I have chosen him to be my son. Now, if you're going to hold that the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 are angels, fallen angels, then you have to be consistent and say that, this, that Solomon was a fallen angel. Or, that, so that's one option, be consistent. Consistency in and of itself is not a good thing. You can be bad consistently. You can either hold that position, or you can understand that the phrase son of God or sons of God is contextual, and you have to allow the context to define it. Just like in Job 38 and verse 7, when God laid the foundations of the earth, the sons of God shouted for joy. That can't be man, because man wasn't there when the earth itself was created. He wasn't created until day six to tend and to keep the garden, we're told in Genesis chapter 2. All right, so that's a verse from the, from the Old Testament. Let me run over here real quick. Just And these are verses you'll be familiar with. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Obviously, that's not talking about angels. That's talking about men, but they are sons of God. I will flip over to Romans chapter 8, and I've got it written here. Okay, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You jump down to verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. I mean, this is just, this is not difficult stuff. That, and I've said this before. I'm turning over to Galatians 3 now. The difficulty with Scripture, the so-called discrepancies, contradictions, things like this, it's not because the Bible is contradictory. It's because man will bring with him an idea to Scripture and try to read it into the Scriptures. We're going to deal with this in the early chapters of Genesis. I don't know how much we'll get into it tonight in our Bible class, but there are a lot of what you refer to as theistic evolutionists. They believe in God. They believe that God created, but they also try to squeeze in the evolutionary timetable, the 4.6 billion years, or even the, which that would be the earth, or even the 13.7 billion years of, of the origins of the earth and, and everything that is now. Theistic evolution is a compromise of the creation account. You cannot be a faithful Christian and believe in theists and, and, and be a theistic evolutionist. There's no way. Anyway, Galatians 3.26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The phrase sons of God is always contextual, and you will know what it means by what's going on around it. This word son in the New Testament. Okay, Matthew 5, Romans 8, Galatians 3, those passages we've looked at. The Greek word is huios, and the, the, it's, it's a masculine noun, and it means son, but it can also be translated as posterity, it could be translated as offspring. It could be translated as descendant. You know, the, the context will tell you. Well, so does Galatians 3.26 mean that only males can be sons of God or, or saved? Well, of course not. That's just a, a, a general phrase. You all, Paul's writing to the churches of Galatia, and that in, you can bet that included women. But you're all the sons of God. You're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You are all offspring of God because you've obeyed the gospel. All right? So let me get back here 
to Genesis chapter 6, and I think we'll just wind it down here because, to me, this answer, or this question is answered pretty easily. Now, this idea of, mm, how far do I want to go here? Giants. Let's talk about that for just a minute. I, <laughs> this may be another video, but uh, Genesis 6 and verse 4. There were also giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, well, anyway, uh, giants, and then it says at the end of that verse, those were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now, the Bible does talk to us about men who are of unusual size. Of course, the most, the, the one we're most familiar with would be Goliath, 1 Samuel chapter 17, but there are several others. So I've got some notes written here. i tell you what. I'll just pull it up here on the screen. 2 Samuel chapter 21. This is just by way of illustration. Because again, part of the belief is that, well, the sons of God are angels, and so that's how giants were made. Well, that doesn't follow. That doesn't necessarily follow. That's a, that's a theory that people have, but one thing is not equal to the other. Um, hmm. Here we go. This is 2 Samuel 21, beginning in verse 15. We're not going to read all of this, but it goes down through several verses. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Then, then Ishbi Benob, who was of the sons of the giant. Okay, so th when that's used in the context of David, we know who that giant is. Sons of the giant, whose weight, uh, I'm sorry, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. You keep reading. Uh, another battle with the Philistines. Uh, this is verse 2 Samuel 21, 18. Sibachai, the Hushathite, killed Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. It just, like I said, it, we're not going to read all of these verses, but there are repeated references to this giant. The Bible talks about men in the Old Testament in particular who were of unique size. All right? I've got some verses here. Numbers 13, 33, uh, Deuteronomy chapters 2 and 3 reference these men of, I guess you could say, abnormal size. 2 Samuel 21, another passage is 1 Chronicles chapter 20, and it begins in verse 4, and you read about these giants who are of unusual size. You have one giant here, First Chronicles 20 and verse 6, there was war at Gath, where there were men, where there was a man of great stature, with 24 fingers and toes, six on each hand and six on each foot. He also was born to the giant. Well, he was killed. So you see all of these accounts. These giants are humans. They're men. They're big. There, there's nothing secret here. There's no angelic interbreeding with humans that produced gigantic humans. Uh, we still, you know, you think about it. I don't know what the average size of a male is. Somebody might be able to find that. You're sitting here listening to this. Somebody might be able to Google that. What is the average size of a male around the world? I, I don't know. I'm five foot ten. My son is six foot one. Uh, I personally have known guys that, you know, six, 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 eight. I've known some men that are that are four foot something, or four foot nothing, as some people say. To me, you think of people who and just by way of example. If I were to go to the NBA and stand next to the tallest, biggest player in the National Basketball Association, he would be a giant compared to me. And we would use that word. Again, I'm 5'10". Some of these guys are 7'5", 7'6". They're, they're what, what is that, 24 inches taller than I am. And big time outweigh me. Huge guys. They're giants. Um, there's nothing miraculous about that. There are big people. There are bigger people. There are small people. And the Bible talks about these giants. 
from Genesis chapter 6, several other places, like I said, Deuteronomy 2, Deuteronomy 3. The book of Joshua mentions them several times, starting in Joshua chapter 12. They're always in connection with the Philistines, a certain group of people. Again, there's no, to me, there's no mystery here. There's nothing secret trying to be, that we have to try to find out in regard to, did God allow fallen angels to come to earth, become human, and, and reproduce with women? No. That, that is something that you would have to read into the text. Nothing in Scripture indicates that. Sons of God is a contextual phrase. Allow what's going on around that phrase to define what a son of God is. In Genesis chapter 6, those sons of God are the descendants of Seth, in my opinion. Descendant of Adam, who is the son of God, Luke chapter 3 and verse 38. I think, to me, Luke 3, 38 really helps that discussion, understanding who the sons of God were in Genesis chapter 6. So, guys, I really don't have, I mean, to say anything else would be just repetitive. I don't know what else to talk about here, but it was a question sent to me, and I hope my answers have been coherent and helpful to you. It's a contrast. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. You've got two types of people here. You've got people who are following God and, and people who are not. But notice this too. And I actually saw this. This is not original with me. And it, it, it made sense, but I'll just... Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. But I'll just share it with you, and I'll let you chew on this for a little bit. Okay, so think back to Genesis chapter 3, when Eve was tempted. I want to show you this, because like I said, it stuck out to me. The woman saw that the tree was good, and she took. Okay, saw, good, took. Hmm. Genesis chapter 6. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took. From what I understand, that word good in Genesis 3 and the word beautiful in Genesis 6 are the same Hebrew word. Saul, it's good, and they took. Is there something to that? I don't know. I, I kind of liked it. It, made, it clicked with me. It made sense to me, so I thought I'd share it with you. All right, guys, that's it for today. I appreciate you being on here. Uh, we will be live tonight at 7 p.m. Central. If you're somewhere that does not have Wednesday night services or you're unable to get out for some reason, you can join us. We will be starting. We'll do, we'll do an introduction tonight to the book of Genesis, and I'm looking forward to that. Guys, thanks for being here. Hope you have a good day, and I hope to see you back in here Monday morning at 11 o'clock.